There was a few more things I could say. I, I forgot one thing I was going to say that I should have said that when we had the McLarens again, that, that the original M10 was only ever run as a McLaren the first time it was ever ran in mm. September 1969. After that, it was I classed it as a Matic McLaren. Right. Yeah, because yeah, it was modified so continually, 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 continually. The same with the M10Bs. As we had it and we put it together as, as a McLaren, but after the first test day, there was all Frank's mods went into it all the time. He was very much into the, the only time I got to interview him was quite a few years ago, we, we, we were talking after we spoke about his cars, he was talking about he was working on um, recycled cardboard furniture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're, they're because, and he said, I'm using a lot of the stuff I learned in, mm. you know, that we mm -hmm. learned in monocoque design and making rigid but lightweight mm -hmm. things. I'm now putting to, that's where I'm putting my I imagination. Back, I left in 74 when Frank retired. And then I came back in 1989 when he started his headway helmet business mm. to help him in, in that. And I was back here for about seven months then. And uh, Frank was always the kind of person that you say now that think out of the box you know that there was always you know you take one thing that is learnt in, in, in one um, like in motorsport and he could apply it to something else and he would do I mean he, he went from the headway helmets he went up his company called armor cell which made uh, late lightweight structures very strong structures I believe some of his products were used during the, the um, Olympics and his last project he was working on with solar energy, where a reflective surface where up until when Frank got involved with it was a very heavy structure. He used his knowledge of these lightweight structures that he was, uh, which all, all to do with polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, uh, as you said, recycled cardboards and things like that to make a really, mm -hmm. really, a very, excuse me, a very light reflective surface that where, where it could be moved, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I, I think, he, what he told me. I, I kept in contact with him all the years, right up until 18 months ago when, it, when he got seriously ill. And he moved out of his home and had to be moved into a, um, um, oh, what do you call in it? A hospice. A hospice type of situation where it was a bit restrictive for him to use Skype and things yeah. like that, because he was Skyping with me all the time. And um, first, before Skype, it was phone calls two or three times a year. He'd phone me and tell me what he was doing. Um, and that, as I said, we, we've been in contact, I've been, you know, I've known Frank since 1969 and we've been kept in contact all those years, you know. If, if, he'd, if he was doing something now, if he was still here now, and as I said, because I, re I read apart the eulogy at his funeral, and one of my last comments was, I'm sure that Frank is up in heaven now and he's waiting for me to get up there because he's going to have a great big work list for me to do. You know, he's probably going around in St. Peter's chariot and he's worked out some modifications <laughs> and make it go faster. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was certainly ahead of his time, I and mean, you mentioned that that uh, by wing the second when you look at the what's happened since in terms of you know undercar aerodynamics, that was clearly something that he was very you know that interested in at the time. That came about through a um, he was in on a. He was in America on Goodyear race tire business and he attended a tire test, an Indy tire test at the Ontario Speedway in, mm. in, in Los Angeles. And he saw a car going around there that had a wing mounted extremely low, not as low as what the, um, uh, the A50 had in, um, and the A51s had their wings, but um, very low. And he talked to the driver about it and I think the driver was named Jim McElwait, I think it was. Anyway, he came back from the test and he came down to the workshop and he picked up our spare wing and he mounted it, you know, put it down on the floor and I think on a couple of oil cans or something like that. And he said, Derek, he said, I want to mount this wing down here. I want to try it. I've seen something and I want to try it. So he, he gave me the, the problem of mounting the wing mm -hmm. and we went out and we tested it. And the first time we tested it, it surface paradise. And after, uh, you know, the morning of testing, he came around and he said, you know, this is working. I, where I used to come onto the straight, which was quite a fast corner, one of the fastest corners I believe in, in, um, in uh, Australia and the one also underneath the bridge at the end. He said, well, I would come in there on a, just 
gradually putting the power down and putting the power down. I could come around there flat. flat you know, I could just put the power down and not worry about having to wait for the grip and things like that. And what it turned out to be, when you look at what, what's around now, it was a blown diffuser. Yeah. You know, the air was being blown out of the exhaust pipe over the top of the wing, and it must have been you know, creating a low, uh, low pressure underneath the wing. In those days, we didn't know about it. Yeah. You know, aerodynamics on racing cars, uh, as far as wings concerned, was in its infancy, and, and we didn't know the intricacies that we all know now. But when, um, when I think about it now, that was a blown diffuser, you know, and, and it worked. And we kept it on the car because the car was more stable when he could put power on, on, on all the time. And also, it created such a big mess of air behind that anybody yes. coming up behind him couldn't, couldn't get close to him. And, and when they did get close to him, they lost their downforce on their front wings. Hence the problem in Formula One those days. And hence the problem in Formula One. But I mean, we're talking about where this has come in relevant in the last, say, 10 years in Formula One. Frank, you know, with ground effects, especially with like Red Bull using the, you know, the, the blown diffuser where they, you know, with um, Sebastian Vettel being able to drive, you know, using mm. that so well um, and the car being so fast. And as we know that Vettel won his championships with the, the aid of this blown diffuser, we had it back then. Mm. And if we'd had an aerodynamicist or something like that, I'm sure we would have ended up with a ground effect car probably as quick as they had them developed in in um in formula one frank while we were doing the um the last races or over the winter of 73 74 there was already plans going for um an a54 which would have been a slightly a different monocoque at this time and um he always had ideas there was always i had a notebook at that stage where we were making plans for what we were going to do you know, how we were going to make the tub and um, where we were going to put the fuel, you know, we were, um, um, and things like that. And, um, and I'm sure that we would have ended up with a car with a flat floor underneath the engine, where these cars have got no floors underneath yeah. the engine, but we would have ended up with a, a, a floor and with the wing back on the car. Yeah. But maybe, and I remember Frank talking about we should make it smaller next time, not such a big wing. But he was like it all the time. I mean, his, his engines, the, 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 the painstaking detail that Frank went to with the fuel cams, that these engines run on a fuel cam. Frank would be getting me to um, apply, um, put silver solder on the cam face, right? So he could file his own fuel cams, so he could get a better response out of certain corners. We had individual fuel cams for every Circuit, circuit where most drivers just had a fuel cam and, and, and that was it and they they um, they drove their cars with what Repco gave them if they were using you know the comparable Repco engines. I can remember a story where inadvertently um, John McCormack um, had uh, got his engine back from Repco and it had one of Frank's fuel cams in it and he couldn't believe the difference <laughs> because of the response of the engine. It, the engines didn't have any more power than he had, but it had, it, the car was more drivable because it, he had one of Frank's fuel cams in it. And that was all obviously in the days before, you know, electronic con yeah, control yeah, units and I all mean, that. So the engine behind us is just mechanically controlled, you know, with a fuel cam, and um, and um, and it was, you know, the basic design. But Frank had filed his fuel cams. To, he would come. In, he would come into the pit sometimes with the engine turned off and his foot on the throttle, and he'd be telling me to mark the fuel cam. Mm. And and then you take the fuel cam out. So I'd mark it, and you take the fuel cam out. And we had this little device we made for him, which had, had the centre pin, the, the 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 pivot pin for the fuel cam. Mm. He had a dial gauge that come down on it, and it had a protractor. Right. So Frank knew how much he was opening the throttle and he would measure um, the, how much the can was lifting or how much it was deep, you know, going away and, and that's where he either wanted material added or subtracted to make the, the fuel either richer or weaker. weaker and so he could get a better response from his engines. Yes, he was. He was. He was certainly the uh, certainly the you know, innovator and uh, yeah, and he, and he was and on top of that, he, he was a first class. Um, driver and, and what a lot of Australians don't know, uh, and, and 
I suppose we're still being recorded. Yeah. Now, but you can edit in this. Yeah. You? Oh, one mm -hmm. of the things that a lot of people don't know, but Frank was a member of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, and he was the only member that never drove in a Grand Prix. Okay. At the time, the drivers like Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Jack Brabham, and Sterling Moss wanted Frank to join their 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 club as such, which mm -hmm. they, or their association, because they knew how good he was, mm -hmm. and they wanted his input in, into um, the Grand Prix Drivers Association. And, and records show that he was the only driver that never drove in Formula mm -hmm. One. Uh, they didn't invite people like and, um, AJ Foyt or, 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 or Petty or somebody like that from America, but they invited mm -hmm. Frank Matthews, Frank. and he was, a, he was, he was that. So he was, you know, I said, that's how good he was and how he was respected also among the drivers um, of the era, you know. It's funny, I mean, it's, it's not just it's not just for, uh, with Frank, but also with, with Sir Jack and with people like Peter Brock and, and those sort of people. When you go overseas, remember we interviewed Murray Walker at one stage and Murray said at the time, he said, I, he said, I cannot tell you how surprised I am to see how little the average Australian race fan knows about Jack Brabham compared with the response he gets overseas. Well, that's the same with Frank Malich. On the flight over here, uh, I was talking to the cabin crew and I told them why, I, you know, they asked me, what, you know, is this your first trip to Australia? I said, no, I used to live over here in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And said, well, why are you coming back? And I said, um, I'm coming back for the funeral of one of your, you know, your, your um, famous sportsmen. And when I mentioned, them, you know, Frank, and they, oh, who's that? I said, well, Frank Maddich. They'd never heard of him. Once I mentioned Peter Brock, they remember who he was, but they, nobody, and the, these were guys that um, um, I think one of them, you know, I would say was nearly 50 and the other ones were in their 30s, but they never heard of him. And it, I, I think my, personally myself that he, he's not known well enough in this country, you know, and it, where he should have been, you know. Yeah. I mean, yes, it, what you said is right. Probably a lot of people in this country don't even know who Jack Brabham is. They probably all know who Dennis Lilly is, and they probably know who, all your AFL stars and things like that. But Frank represented this country abroad, in America. He was well known in England in the um, late '60s because of his, um, because how good he was. I mean, in the Tasman series of, I think '65 and you know '66 or something like that, when he raced against Jim Clark and Graham Hill, um, people like that. You know, he was as good as them and he had inferior equipment um, and they all talked about him and I, you know, when I was, before I came out here, first of all, there were people I could talk to who had come out here and done the Tasman series for Lotus and BRM and people like that and they would all tell me, oh yeah, he's good, you know, he's, you know, he's very good. And that was the advantage of the Tasman series back in those days, especially in those early days, because you would get the very best drivers in the world would come out yeah. and they'd see people like Frank and Leo Gagan and all of those people and say, you know, these guys actually are, are very talented. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the Tasman series in 64, 65 and 66, well, right the way up to actually 68, you had world champions coming out here. You had Jim Clark, um, Graham Hill, John Surtees, um, uh, Jochen Rint, um, Jackie you know, Stewart, Jackie Stewart, Piers Courage. Um, you had all these drivers coming out here to do the Tasman series because they wanted to to keep driving through the winter, the European winter. And Frank was among them. He, he was not just racing with them; he was racing with them at the front of the grid all the time. And as Peter Windsor recently has reminded everybody about the race that Frank had with Jimmy Clark up at, at Lakeside. Um, uh, but uh, there was other races as well where Frank was always on the front row of the grid and, and racing with them at the front. Um, he, he was good. He was very good. Yes, yes certainly. Yeah, um, Certainly was. Well, I certainly remember, as I said, my, my first ever meeting was the 72 Tasman, and I, 
I was it was my eleventh birthday mm. treat, and I just saw and heard the Formula Five Thousands come out, and from then on I was hooked. That which, was it. Which was your first race at, at, on the seventy two seventy two Tasman, Tasman yeah. here at Sandown. Yeah, here at Sandown. Yeah, so it was one that Graham McRae won. Beat. Yeah. yeah, I think we were leading the race, if I remember rightly, yes. and we had an engine problem, um, and and that, and unfortunately, you. Frank was doing the development work on holding engines all the time and so obviously we had sometimes we had engines that were super and sometimes we had engines that, that were a little bit fragile um, and that um, but you know he, he, he did the best and he was you know he, he um, represented the country and the companies that he you know he was a good ambassador for Repco and he was a good ambassador for Australia and for Penfolds Wines <laughs> and and um, and that um, I think he was a great help to a lot of competitors over here, yeah. though they probably wouldn't have um, acknowledged it at the time. Um, uh, but he, you know, he supported John Walker um, when he started in Formula Five Thousand, yes. when he bought a Matic off of us. Um, and I, I know jolly well that he helped other drivers mm -hmm. with, with with things, you know, that, which, which he could help with, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know. He, you know, I keep saying this, but to me, he was the best. And I've been involved in motorsport for nearly 40, well, over 40 years. And my best times and my best memories are those five years I had working for Frank. Yeah. Well, it was certainly fun. As I've told people on many occasions, I was 11 years old at the time. And I remember there was Graham McRae, there was Frank Maddich in the sports dance. There was Peter Brock, Alan Moffat, Bob Jane, Frank Gardner. And who'd have known that sort of, you know, 40, 40 years later on, I've interviewed all those people and had them on the show so um, it's 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 a great it's, it's a great memory and uh, to get the opportunity to speak with you and in front of this fabulous car albeit with a chef engine at the moment it's um and, the, it's, and a it's a fabulous Frank uh, would say I mean, he never bought, built a car with a chef engine but this brian has done a, uh, and his father has done a great job of restoring this car into the condition it's in it looks i you know when i looked at it when i came here and i saw it it just brought back memories mm. it look, apart from the bit the lump of, of <laughs> car stein behind me it it does look absolutely um, you know just as i remember it the last time we used this car was the in 1973 um would have been adelaide in 1973 the last time this car ran with frank in it and it looks exactly the same mm -hmm. as it did then you know um and you know this car i think it did 25 or 26 races but as I said earlier, it probably done more miles testing than it did racing. <laughs> you know, it, we were always up at Surface Paradise testing or Warwick Farm or Oran Park. Um, uh, but it was a good car, you know, it, it was a good car.